Hello everyone. In this video, I want to give you an overview of Crippling Depression version 4. This is the most current and recent version of Crippling Depression. This is what will be competing at Motorama 2019 here in one week. Although if you're watching the video right now, Motorama is currently happening. So in this video, I want to give you an idea of what's changed from version 4 versus version 3. And I also want to show you all the different configurations that Crippling Depression has. I now have four different weapon options and two different wedge options. So I want to kind of go over the different configurations in that. So let's get started. So for anyone out there that has a really keen attention to detail, you might notice one thing. You might notice that crippling depression is no longer black. That's right, it is now hot pink. And I did this for a couple different reasons. I posted a um, kind of a joke thread on a Facebook group asking, you know, what version of black should I do for version four crippling depression? And a bunch of people piped up with hot pink. So there you go. Here is hot pink crippling depression. It's also pretty hilarious to see a bright pink crippling depression. I personally kind of hate pink, but I think it's interesting just for, just for this version and just for this iteration. So that is what color it is. Uh, so let's start out with the kind of overall style and all the um, different design elements that I went into for this version. I did a little bit more than I previously have for version one and two, as I've talked about in previous videos, I wanted version one and two to be kind of plain. I wanted it to be underestimated. I just want it to be kind of a plain black box. For version three, that's when all the angles got added, the slope down in the back, and it was a little bit flashier. So for version four, I wanted it to be really flashy, almost kind of garish and visually offensive you know, within reason. So this is what version four looks like. So let's bring the camera in, get a closer view and see all the various little design elements of Crippling Depression version four. So here is the new look for Crippling Depression version four. As you can see, and you will see further throughout this robot, there's a lot of branding going on. Obviously I've got my logo here on the top and then if we flip this over to the bottom you can see my logo mirrored all along the bottom here so that's kind of what the um, bottom armor looks like and this and the top is still carbon fiber um, so this is still the carbon fiber that i used on the previous version this was actually laser etched as is the bottom this one was a little bit different. Um, it's a much thicker line, and anyone that uses a laser knows that you can't really get a thick line from laser. But what you can do is defocus the laser beam by basically manually unfocusing it up a little bit. That widens the beam because the beam kind of comes at like a cross. It's a cone. And so if you move it further away, you get this wider um, line. And it actually kind of looks like it was um, branded or burned on there. So. That is what the top looks like. Now the whole frame was painted. I have about three or four coats of this hideous pink on here. And after the three or four coats dried, um, I went through with steel wool and um, kind of um, knocked down the shine. And you might notice, especially on the front and some of the corners, that it's kind of like a little bit dirty and a little bit aged and like kind of weathered. Um, I've been playing a lot of Borderlands lately and I kind of like the art style of that game. And what I kind of want it to look like is something that was painted and taken care of, but at the same time, you know, very dirty and just kind of worn. So what I did is I have this really old shop rag that's just kind of disgusting. It's what I use for all my grease and oil stains and stuff like that. And after I would get done using the steel wool, I would go back over with my shop rag and actually rub it. So that's why I get kind of these, um, you know, streaks of grime all throughout it. So you can kind of see it, you know, a little bit along this edge and along here. And, you know, the corners are knocked down to bare aluminum. I wanted something that just looked like it had been around for a while. And then obviously I have the black accents with all the screws. The wedge mounts in the back are still the black. So. Yeah, that is kind of um, the look of Crippling Depression. So let me get some more shots here. Um, I really like how this back turned out. It's um, very interesting. Let me just double check, make sure I am in focus here. There we go. 
So that is a little bit better look at the whole back, and it turned out to be a kind of an interesting pattern. And when I talk about the configurations, this will be visible quite a bit. So yeah, that is the overall look for Crippling Depression version four. So functionally, what has changed from version four to version three? Well, not really that much. The frame is nearly identical to the old one. The one thing that I did do is I distributed some weight around. So the overall geometry of the whole chassis, um, I'm showing this just because this is kind of the base configuration without a weapon, without a wedge. Um, so, you know, this is just kind of the bare robot not a whole lot has changed in terms of the shape of everything. If I had the old one, which like here's the old faceplate, the overall dimensions are pretty much identical to the last one. What I did do is change the internal frame structure just a little bit, and then I also removed some weight with places that didn't get hit. I never really get hit on the sides, so I made certain aspects of this a lot thinner and then moved the weight up to the front, so the front is a lot thicker on the internals. You can see that I've got all these weight-saving pocket here. These pockets are thicker, well, I guess, okay, the pockets don't go as deep on this version, so this weighs a little bit more. The sides weigh less, and the back actually weighs less because the wedges pretty much cover the back, so I don't really have to worry about that as much. So just a little bit of weight shifting. The other main thing that I did with the internal frame, here is one of the old internal frames, in version three, I decided to go with these um, square nuts. So the screw would come down and then it would be held in place by the square nuts. Now this is largely for the armor panels, but it is also for the back and the front panels as well. And what happened in the fight with Beam is the whole front panel was ripped off and it allowed it to be ripped off because there was only about an eighth of an inch worth of thread holding that front panel on. So pulling the screw out of an eighth inch square nut is pretty easy to do. And so what I did on this version is the front panel is now threaded about an inch or an inch and a half back all the way. I got rid of the square nuts from the front and the back and just threaded straight through in the aluminum. I changed the geometry up just a little bit to allow myself more room. And as you see from this panel as well, there's some weak points. You know, if we look up close right here and I talk about this in the damage report, there's just some weak junctions because of these square nuts. So I moved all of those pieces around so that the screws that connect this front panel on are much deeper. I even went so far on these sides to bump out this front aluminum much deeper. So these screws actually go like an inch and a half back into the side panels. So the front panel is held on a lot better. Other than that, I am using the same motors, same electronics, same wheels. I did have to rebuild the drive pods because they got pretty trashed in the last competition. So I rebuilt those, but I didn't really make any changes, just, you know, lightened them up a tiny bit here and there. And I am using a smaller and lighter battery. It's got the same voltage, same um, cell rating, same discharge. It's just physically a little bit smaller and that helps me with a little bit more padding. So that's really all that's changed, um, but I will talk about the configurations because I've added a couple new things. So let's see all the different configurations of Crippling Depression version four. So let's first talk about the wedges. Crippling Depression now has two wedges. The very first wedge, which is this one, made its debut in version three. And this is an eighth inch thick plate of titanium that is bent and it does have these UHMW arms. I'll go into more detail on these later. These are new for this version. We have this wedge and then we also have the mega wedge. This one is eighth inch titanium. This is 0.28 seven inches titanium. This is uh, more than double the thickness and this is a very beefy, heavy duty wedge. And this is for the upside down configuration for use with the overhead bar. And this does have the same arms as well. So let's talk a little bit about these arms. At AVC, that was the um, first debut of the wedge. And in the first fight against um, Yahoo, it was a drum bot, it ripped my wedge off. And the problem was the screws that hold the wedge on 
were not into the UHMW, there was these cross arms that went through with aluminum and it was actually threaded into the aluminum and it pulled the threads right out. And aluminum is a reasonably soft material. So what I've done for this version is a lot of different things. The first thing that I did was I'm using these inserts that go all the way through the UHMW arms and these are actually tapered and they have a really aggressive thread and they're put into this with substantial amounts of pressure and to pull them out or to pull this wedge arm off of it, it would need to basically destroy this UHMW. So we're gonna see how that works out. Now what's interesting is the smaller wedge uses a 1032 screw and the bigger wedge uses a number or a quarter inch screw, but the wedges and the arms are the same. I just use different inserts. So that's kind of nice that it's a little bit universal. These can actually pull out. I can put in a new insert, so that is cool. The other thing that I've done to modify this is you can see right here and right here, I have these titanium bars that actually sandwich on the um, little connector bolts right there. So I'm kind of concerned about this pulling out, right? If I get a really big hit, this bolt could just pull off of these mounts. Well, the titanium is there to prevent that hopefully from happening. There is a bolt that goes through right there that holds it against the UHMW arm, and then also it holds this in place. So it would have to tear through the UHMW and tear through the both um, the little titanium stabilizers as well. So hopefully this makes the wedges work a lot better. For weapons, I'm still running the same weapon setup. I've still got the same weapon block and um, the weapon hubs. And for this year, I am going to be running the full bar. I ran this bar like a couple times at AVC, but right, the event organizers were not too thrilled with me running such a powerful and large weapon um, the way I did it. So now I've modified it with this new hub. This is machined from a solid block of aluminum. This actually replaces the hub that's currently in there, and this stands it off enough to basically clear the wheels, and it gives it a really solid mounting point. And you can go back on my previous videos and look how this whole hub system works, but I have um, two large taper roller bearings that go through there, and then a large bolt that bolts that whole assembly with a titanium cap on top, and then it is bolted into the weapon with these three 3 8 inch bolts and then you know the bolt goes through the center and holds the whole thing together so i have a um, pretty high level of confidence that this isn't going to break it's going to be pretty devastating we'll see how that works out um, but having this solid piece hub should make that work a lot better i will be using my um, big tooth disc uh, my other two weapon discs are actually not here right now. I have two more weapon discs um, with varying sizes of teeth. They are being remachined. Um, I'm having them surface down to make them a little bit thinner because they kind of drag a little bit. The teeth are mostly worn out on them, so this is the only good tooth I have left. So this is going to be my primary weapon, and it does have a good amount of bite. So that's how it's going to look in terms of weapons. So let's kind of um, put these bars on there, and I'll show you the different configurations and kind of what they're good at and what they're not good at. So here is the standard configuration of crippling depression. Um, you've got the weapon disc underneath in the front. This is a true undercutter at this point. And then we have the lightweight wedge in the back. This whole thing weighs in just about 29.7 pounds. So it's just under the 30 pounds limit. And this is very effective against other undercutters um, verticals because it likes to chew at the wedge. I also use this for other wedges. And really in this configuration, the wedge is just for a little bit of weight balance and a little bit of um, self-assurance in case the weapon dies. Um, but this is kind of the standard configuration and this is the original design for crippling depression. Now what we can do is we can run this upside down just by flipping the wedge. So let's do that. And here is the upside down primary configuration. We still have the wedge. The wedge mounts to those little nubs that are on the frame and they are centered with the wheels. So no matter which way the wedge mounts, it will always still have the same geometry and ride the floor the same way. 
This is a good configuration um, because one, it partially protects the top of the robot. I use this against Megatron because he has that overhead arm thing that comes down. And with this weapon spinning, you don't really want to hit a hammer or an arm into this because you're probably going to have a bad time of it. It drives slightly different, but surprisingly, it's pretty similar to how it drives the other way. It just has a little bit less control this way. This is very useful if I'm facing anyone that one has an overhead arm or someone that I just want to hit a little bit higher. So like when I fought Beam, I knew that I wasn't going to get under to anything with Beam. I wanted to hit him up high. So this is better for hitting up high and I can usually catch the top of wheels as long as they are about the same size as I am. Sometimes when you're hitting the bottom of wheels, you just tend to drive right over top of the weapon. And that happens a lot with a, you know, really small undercutter like this. You can just drive right over top of it or the wheel will bounce up. But if you hit the top of a wheel and kind of hit it down, you can typically break something that way. So this is the, I guess, standard invertible configuration. And just a note with um, all of these configurations, I do have my remote set up for an invert so I can drive forward. That I can make this the forward or I can make this the forward just with one switch. And that also is the same switch for driving upside down or right side up. So these are these two configurations and I can just swap out the discs for the different discs that I want. Now let's look at the overhead bar. And here is the new version of the overhead bar assembly. So the overhead bar gives me several distinct advantages. One is reach. And if I extend the bar out, you can see that I have about eight inches worth of reach. Now it is really up high, so it won't work on any low robots. But that is why I have the wedge over here. As you can see, the bar comes right across the front of the wedge. So in theory, the wedge doesn't have a great slope to it. I wish it could be, you know, much further out, but that takes up a lot more weight. In theory, if someone rides up, it can clip them up top. So in theory, if I'm fighting someone that is really low to the ground, I can use the wedge, make them ride up on the wedge and hit them with the weapon that way. Or if someone is tall enough, I can go this way. And same rules apply. I can call this the front or I can call this the front. Doesn't really matter. This is also nice for any overhead attacks because this covers the entire footprint of the robot. I think there's a little section right here, just this teensy little corner, this little corner, and then obviously the wedge are unprotected, but everything else in this whole radius is covered. So if the weapon is spinning, an overhead attack would not be very smart. And just to look at it from the front, um, you've got the big wedge on there and it is nice and articulating and it actually can't stop on the wedge. It will always want to go down, which is kind of nice. The big downside to doing this configuration is I am not invertible and if I get upside down, it's going to be a problem. I'll show you what that looks like. So the wheels don't even come close to touching. I guess, I guess they touch a little bit, um, but that is only in this perfect scenario. If it was back a little, I don't want to gouge my workbench too much here, but in this scenario, I mean, it is very much high sided. So there is definitely a risk. I will not be using this configuration if there is any risk of being flipped upside down just because that is going to happen. So if I'm facing a flipper or a vertical spinner, this will not be the configuration I use unless I'm just feeling really silly. So there you go. Those are the various configurations for crippling depression version four. So this concludes the overview for crippling depression version four. Hopefully this all works out well at Motorama. I think by the time most of you are watching this video, we'll have a pretty good idea of that. Right now, I have no idea how this is all going to shape out, but look forward to the damage report and the fight recap videos that I will be doing after Motorama. And as always, you can check me out on Facebook, check out any updates and um, things like that that I have to my channel. And there's also a link down below that you can help support my channel. So. As always, thanks for watching. See you then.